Corner Fringe Ministries presents a two-part series named Strange Fire. You are now listening to part one. Enjoy. But today, we're going to be looking at a story of the death of Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu. In the, in the English, Nadab and Abihu. In the Hebrew, it's Nadab and Avihu. And I only mention that up front because I go back and forth. And I want to make sure I'm talk- you know that I'm talking same people, whether I say uh, Nadav or Nadab or uh, Abihu or Avihu, same people. These are the first two born sons to Aaron. Now, we're actually told Aaron was given, he was blessed with four children. So Numbers chapter 3, verse 2, we read, and these are the names of the sons of Aharon, Nadav the firstborn, Avihu, Eleazar, and Edomar, or Ithamar. Now, if you're familiar with who Aaron and his sons were, they were called out to be separate to God. They were called out from Israel to be separated to the Lord alone for a very, very special purpose. And we find that purpose in Exodus 28, verse 1. Now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel. See, they're being called out. They're being separated that he may minister to me as priest, as Cohen. Aharon and Aharon's sons, Nadav, Avihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. So here we see Aaron was blessed with four sons. Here we see Aaron and his sons they were actually called out. They were called out from uh, uh, amongst Israel to serve as Kohanim, to serve as priests before the Lord. And one thing you've got to realize is the awesomeness of the office of the Kohanim. I mean, they were the ones that stood before the Lord. They were the ones interceding on behalf of the sins of Israel. See, because the Kohanim, they made atonement for the sins of Israel. It is as highly decorated as one could get. This is an awesome and powerful office. Now, before we begin our story today... I want to give you a little further background into these two sons, the first two born sons of Aharon, of Nadab and Abihu. Yes, we know they were Kohanim, right? Yes, we know they interceded on behalf of Israel. But there's something else I want you to be aware of, something that's very, very important for you to take into consideration as we proceed in this story today to learn about their death, to learn about why they died. This is something that you need to have in the back of your mind. And it's an experience. It's an experience that they had. A very, very unusual experience. And we find it in Exodus 24, verse 1, and we read, Now he said to Moshe, Come up to the Lord, you and Aharon, Nadav and Avihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Okay, so here we see that the Lord commands them, come up, you're, you're to come up to me, and you're to worship me. It's a very special situation of what's going on. But notice you'll say, it says to your, you're to worship from afar. This select group was picked to come to him to worship him from afar. Only Moses was allowed to draw near. But this was a very, very select group. And called out by name. Only Aaron, Nadav, and Abihu, and then the 70 elders of Israel. Which is to say, when it says the 70 elders of Israel, this is the judges. These are the judges of Israel. Now we continue, dropping down to verse 9. Then Moshe went up, also Aharon, Nadav, Avihu, the 70 elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. This is exactly, I want want to stop here, because you need to understand this is not a poor translation. This is not a mistranslation. Vayiru et Elohei Israel. It means exactly what we read in the English. They saw the God of Israel. Do you understand how insane this really is? Because according to Scripture, you cannot see God and live. You can't see God and live. And yet, we see this select group that God handpicked to come and worship from afar, they literally saw the God of Israel. And this is how it reads in the Hebrew. Talk about an experience. And any question as to the, the validity of our understanding, though, well, they didn't. What, they, maybe, maybe they saw a vision. They didn't really see God. 
with their own eyes. Hold on, we continue. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. Why does he have to add this statement? This is a statement of necessity. Because we all know that you cannot see God and live. And yet we see the statement of necessity added that, hey, but I didn't lay in my hand on them. They gave him a pass. He allowed them to see him without him killing them. This is a pretty intense situation. So they saw God and they ate and drank. So here we have these sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, literally have an encounter with God. And just think about this scenario and and how it would be life transforming. I mean, you wouldn't come out of that situation and look at each other and go, well, that went really well. I really enjoyed that. I'd like to do that again. You would come out of there unspeakable. You wouldn't be able to speak words. You just saw the creator of heaven and earth. It's like seeing your, your life flash before your eyes. There's no words. You would come out of this experience with your jaw dropped. And so you would never, ever be the same again after seeing the God of Israel. So, with that said, I want to begin our story with that backdrop. And we're gonna, I'm going to take you to the book of Leviticus, chapter 10. Before we go there, I just want to lay a little bit of groundwork for you. In the 8th chapter, we actually find that the Lord commands Moses, go gather the children of Israel together at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. He does so. And he begins to go through this ceremonial consecration service where he's going around and he starts consecrating the tabernacle. He starts anointing the tabernacle. He consecrates uh, Aaron and his sons. They go through a mikvah. He anoints them with oil. Okay, he's going through all of these things, sprinkling blood on them, right? And then we discover that, okay, after all this beautiful of going through this mikvah, Aaron, who is the Kohen Gadol, he's the high priest, Moses clothes him. He receives a new set of garments. And this is what these garments uh, essentially would look like, roughly. It's here you have the breastplate, beautiful garments. You would never ask, and if you've been with me, you know I've always say this, No one ever asked who the high priest was. They knew exactly who the Kohen Gadol was because no one dressed like him. He was unique. He was one of a kind. He sat exalted, high, supremacy. He he sat in a supremacy seat. And so here you had the the holiness unto the Lord, the mitre, and the the, the breastplate. You You can't see them here, but there's supposed to be onyx stones with the tribes of Israel. This beautiful garment, the ephod, which comes around. It's in the back of blue, purple, scarlet, and gold. I mean, absolutely beautiful. And so all of these things are happening. The consecration of the tabernacle, the consecration of Aaron and his sons to serve as Kohanim. Aaron is adorned with glory and beauty. It's beauty and splendor. This is the very purpose of his garments. You read Exodus 28. All right? Then, as we come to chapter 9, Moses, he warns Aaron and his sons. He tells them, listen, today the Lord is going to appear to you. Okay? That would have resonated with them, right? Because they already had this experience, going back to Exodus. And when they say the glory of the Lord is going to appear to you, this is where your knees start knocking, you start trembling. And he says, you need to go, prepare, get ready, because the glory of the Lord is coming down You need to sacrifice. And that's exactly what they do. He listens to Moses. They begin to sacrifice at which point, and bring you up to speed, at which point we enter our story in Leviticus 9.22 and we read, Then Aharon lifted his hand toward the people. And it's actually, most translations have it more accurate, his hands. And uh, toward the people, blessed them, and came down from offering the sin offering, the burnt offering, and peace offerings. And Moshe and Aharon went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory, the kavod of the Lord appeared to all the people. Okay, so all the congregation was a part of this revelation where the kavod, the glory of God, was literally seen. Now we continue in verse 24. And fire came out 
from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. See, this is, this is what happens when you have an experience with the glory of God. You fall down flat on your face. This is what happens. But here's where we get to it. Very next verse. What do Nadab and Abihu do? Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aharon, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So no sooner do Nadab and Avihu, they get consecrated for the ministry of the Lord. They go through this awesome declaration. They had already previously to that had 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 an awesome experience with the Lord. And then we find the glory of the Lord comes down here, and what happens? They make an offering, and God kills them. What just happened here? I mean, you got to think about it. None of this makes sense. What just happened? Why are they dead? Why did the Lord kill them? Interestingly enough, this event has been the subject of a lot of debate. This whole event has been a subject of great discussion amongst uh, your pastors, your teachers, your scholars alike, in regard to what really truly happened in this event. And there are various ideas and scenarios that have been proposed in regard to what really took place here and why the Lord actually killed Nadav and Abihu. And I want to look at some of these, some of these proposals. And I want to do so because I, I, I want to attempt to get to the bottom. I want to know what just happened in this event. I mean, what truly went wrong? So with that said, I want to begin with the first proposal. There are some who think that uh, the situation was as such. Nadav and Avihu, they were drunk. Or even some will say, well, they they weren't even necessarily drunk. They were just polluted with strong drink. They were polluted with wine. And this is why the Lord killed them. Now, the idea has some merit. They didn't just come up with this on their own accord. This wasn't their own opinion, the people that stand in this group that propose this. There's actually, they will suggest, evidence right in the very chapter itself. In Leviticus 10. And let me show you. Leviticus 10, chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 8. Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. And it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. So some are proposing that, hey, this is evidence. This is evidence of what really happened. And why they offered strange fire, this profane fire. They were drunk. They were polluted. They had wine in them. Now, while I certainly can understand why someone might approach it from uh, this angle, why they might come to this conclusion based upon what we just read in in these verses, right? However... I do think there are some unanswered questions and there are some things to consider. If you're going to make this assessment, there are some things that need to be considered. Number one, the story itself. I mean, we need to consider the story itself. In other words, I think the concept of of Aaron's sons being drunk, it really begins to break down. That whole idea begins to break down when you consider the fact that Nadav and Avihu prior to offering this profane fire, right, prior to that, what did they do? They're the ones that were assisting in all the sacrifices. Do you understand? They were the ones helping in the sacrifices. So you would have to say then that while they were carrying out the ceremonial sacrifices, assisting Aaron, well, they were drinking. How plausible is that? How likely do you think that is? And let me take it a step further. If they had been drinking while performing the sacrifices, do you think that the Lord would have accepted the sacrifices as he did? Which he clearly did. Would the Lord have consumed the burnt offering if in fact the men assisting were polluted? 
I don't think so. I can't get there. So, in, in my opinion, while this is uh, certainly interesting, an interesting proposal, I don't see that this is actually what happened. I don't see that this is the real issue. So, if, if this proposal really doesn't hold up, at least in my opinion, let's look at another There's another proposal that is that, okay, well, Nadab and Avihu, they died because they offered strange incense. They offered strange incense. And that's what made the fire profane. Okay, well, let's go back and look at uh, chapter 10, verse 1 again. Then Nadab and Avihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it. Put incense on it. Okay, so here we have incense going on top of the fire and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. Now, is it possible that this is what happened? Is is it possible that this is the scenario, that they actually offered a, a polluted incense, a strange incense? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe this is possible. Maybe this is what happened. Let me point something out here to further prove this. Something you might find interesting. Torah is explicit and had already previously warned the Kohanim, warned Moses, warned the children of Israel, that they were not to offer strange incense in the tabernacle. And we see proof of this right in Exodus 30, verse 9. You shall not offer strange incense on it. And this is referring to when you go into the tabernacle, the altar of incense, when you're in the tabernacle, you cannot offer a foreign incense. You understand? It cannot happen. In fact, the Bible, if you go to Exodus 30, you will find that it is explicit in regard to the proprietary blend. There is an ordained blend of incense that could be used, and only that. And it had had elements in it such as frankincense, galbanum, uh, Stack D, um, there's another one, um, Anika. All these elements were a part of the incense. You take any one of those elements out, it is not the holy ordained incense, and therefore would be polluted, and you could not burn it. So the, the composition of the incense was very, very particular, and it's noted in the Torah. Now, Let me take this a step further and show you something very interesting. When we look at these two passages here, and I've circled it, as we come to uh, Leviticus, uh, we're in verse 1 here, it says, He put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire. Now, when we go to Exodus 30, and and it it warns us, you shall not offer strange incense, I want you to know that this word, profane and strange, They are identical. Zerah. Zerah in the Hebrew. In other words, we could read it, and and actually strange is the... I don't have a problem with profane as far as the translation, but hyperliterally, the best way to translate it would be strange because it's utilized as stranger. When you look up this word, you'll see it over and over again, utilized to describe stranger. So if we were to read this, and here they put incense on it, keteret on it, and offered, you look at this Zerah, they offered strange fire before the Lord. And so kind of when you see it in the Hebrew, it makes you think a little bit differently. So, question, could this be actually what happened? Could they have put a strange incense on this, and this is why the Lord killed them. Because explicitly, you weren't allowed to use a foreign incense. Maybe. Maybe. Because I say maybe, because this now, this produces all sorts of other questions. Well, what were they doing with strange incense in the tabernacle to begin with? Did they have their own set right there, their their own set of incense? Why would they even think of bringing their own incense into the tabernacle? Would Moses allow it? Would Aaron allow it? I mean, you have all these questions that go through your mind. Let me take it a step further. Maybe it's a situation where you know that they have the incense in the tabernacle. However, all the different elements like the galbanum, the stockty, and the frankincense were not mixed together. 
and there was no salt on it. And they were all separated, waiting for it to be brought together as one. Is it possible that they, out of haste, the glory of the Lord coming down, that they only grabbed the frankincense and threw it on their censer, and then that is what produced the strange incense? Is that possible? Sure. That's possible, right? I mean, maybe. There's another scenario. Did your head hurt yet? There's another scenario, another proposal. That very may well be the answer to what really happened. Maybe, here's the scenario, maybe Nadav and Avihu picked up their censers, put incense on them, and headed into the Holy of Holies. Okay? Now you might be saying, well, okay, what's wrong with that? And two, where's the evidence of that? I mean, I don't read anywhere in this so far in chapter 10 where they ran into the Holy of Holies, and this is why God killed them. Well, interestingly enough, if you continue in Leviticus, and you come to chapter 16, which is famous to be known as the Yom Kippur passage, the Day of Atonement, as we come to Leviticus 16, look at what we read. Very fascinating. Verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moshe after the death of the two sons of Aaron. When they offered profane fire, strange fire, before the Lord and died. Okay? This is already put into context for you. The Lord came to Moses and spoke to him when? After the death of Aaron's two sons. So here you have this situation. God kills Aaron's two sons. Now he comes to speak to Moses. And here's what he says in verse 2. And the Lord said to Moshe, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. So here, looking at this statement, may this be suggesting that this is exactly what happened on that day. Maybe, perhaps, it may very well be that this is why the Lord killed Nadav and Avihu. They grabbed incense and they ran into the Holy of Holies. Understand, wrong place, wrong time. If, in fact, they were to do that, because you need to understand, you could only enter the Holy of Holies once a year. And that is on Yom Kippur. No other day. It was only on Yom Kippur. So may this be the scenario? Yeah, it may be. And after looking at all of these scenarios that I presented... I think it's time we go back. We go back to the passage in question, and I want to see if we can't get any further insight as to what really happened in this event. So with that said, let's go back to the passage. Then Nadav and Avihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer. Okay, so here, you know, they grabbed their censers, and this is something that, you know, the, the, the high priest, this, you would have seen, this is something that he would have, on Yom Kippur, he does burn in, uh, in, in the Holy of Holies. Okay? So here they grab their censers and put fire in it. And this could have been the coals. Okay? And put incense on it. So we have three things happening here. We have a censer. We have coals being put in there, coals of fire. And then now they're putting incense on it. And offered profane. The result of that is they offered strange fire, Zerah offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So when we look at this passage, one thing I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that cannot be debated whatsoever is that Nadab and Abihu did something that the Lord didn't command them. There's no question, okay? That's not what's being debated here. They offered a fire that God had not commanded. It is that simple. And I want you to appreciate what is really going on in this story. What's really happening. You need to see it for what it is. I need you guys to understand this. It's critical. Because Nadab and Abihu, they fell into a transgression that is so easy to fall into. 
It's so easy for every one of us to fall into. When we look at what happened here, we discovered that these sons of Aaron, they were entirely moved by emotion. They were moved by emotion. They were driven by the dictates of their own heart. And they took it upon themselves to honor God. And that's what they thought they were doing. They took it upon themselves to go out and honor God in a manner they saw fit. And the story should terrify you. It terrifies me. It terrifies me on multiple levels. I can still to this day remember the first time I read this story. I was petrified. What did this story do for me? It put back into context that our God is holy. That's what it did for me. It, it, and that's what needs to happen with us. There's a disconnect, unfortunately, with us and with Yeshua at times. We forget He is holy. And the way we present ourselves in prayer. So Blase is like, oh, I, you know, I'm just going to give it up to the Lord. I'm just going to come in and pray. Let me tell you, when you enter prayer, you respect the Lord. And you proceed with fear and trembling. He is holy, lest you be smitten. And don't provoke him because of his patience with you. Amen? There's another aspect that terrifies me about this story. I mean, to the very core. And that's when I look and see what the church is doing today, and I look at the story of of Nadab and Abihu, and I see the same thing happening. It terrifies me. We see believers in Yeshua, they're moving, they're worshiping Him in a fashion that is not a product of Scripture, that is not a product of His voice or His commandments. It is a product of their own emotions. It's a product of their own feelings. We have believers today, literally, following in the very footsteps of Nadav and Avihu. According to the promptings of their own heart. And what we have is they are offering profane fire. They're offering strange fire. Let me dig into this even further on a different level. Let me give you another biblical example of Nadab and Abihu. All right? And we're going to go to 1 Samuel 15, verse 1. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, heed the, heed the uh, voice of the, uh, of the words of the Lord. Okay, that, that, this, is, this is a testimony for every one of us. Heed the word of the Lord. Heed the voice of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them. But kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and and donkey. The command was given to Saul, leave nothing. There's not to be a trace of Amalek from human being to beast. Nothing is to be left. Dropping down to verse 7. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed All the people with the edge of the sword. Okay. Going on to verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they destroyed. So we see here that Saul didn't do exactly what the Lord had commanded, but rather he moved according to the dictates of his own heart. The things that he thought were worth saving, he saved not for himself. They didn't save it. He didn't save it for the children of Israel. It was to be given to God. This was in honor of the Most High God. This is going to, this is going to be reserved for the God of Israel. In other ways, other words, Saul had a better way. I've conceived a better plan to honor you, Father, than what you've even proposed. 
Think about that for a second. How does the Lord respond to this? We continue in verse 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. So the Lord goes to Samuel, and he educates Samuel on how he feels about this action, about what Saul had really done, right? And this is where things get really interesting. Because how does Saul, this is the most critical component, how does Saul feel about what he has done? Well, let's go and see in verse 13. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. The first thing out of his mouth was, I have done what the Lord has told me to do. I am in the service of the Lord. This is how, this is how Saul sees it. Go on to verse 14. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? In other words, Samuel saying to Saul, Are you kidding me? Everything that was Amalek's was to be destroyed, and yet I'm hearing the lowing of the oxen. I'm hearing the sheep talk to me. They should be dead. There should be nothing left. And we go on to verse 15. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. In other words, despite what we are commanded by the Lord, we thought of a better way to honor Him. Better than what He had suggested. We thought it best that we keep what is good. And we will pay homage to God by offering up what is good to Him. The story sounds eerily familiar to what Nadab and Abihu did. They did the exact same thing. They moved out of the emotions of their own heart. They went forward, make no mistake, they went forward to honor God. And yet it cost them their lives. Because they did what they were not commanded to do. Saul just did what he was not commanded to do. And yet in his own mind, He's he's honored God. Terrifying. So how does Samuel handle the situation? And we need to listen to this. Then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And Saul said to him, Speak on. And Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Going on to verse 18. Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners. See, the whole point of destroying the Amalekites is they were coming under judgment of God. The sinners were to be destroyed. Nothing left. So he says, Destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? This is rebuke. You think you've done something right. No, you haven't. You haven't did what God commanded. Why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Now listen to this response. Here he's rebuked by the prophet Samuel. Credible source. And Saul knew exactly what he was commanded to do. So so Samuel rebukes Saul. How does Saul respond now? Verse 20. And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Second time he has said this. What are you talking about? I've done what's right. I've done exactly what the Lord told me to do. And gone on the mission which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. And he goes on to explain now. Let me me explain to you, Samuel, my position here. But the people took the plunder, the sheep and oxen, the best of the things, the best of the things, which should have been utterly destroyed out of his own confession, these things should have been destroyed. But we took them to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. We have a better way of honoring you. Samuel continues, he says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings 
and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. You understand? This is the lesson. You listen to God. Stop listening to men. They will deceive you. Every word that I speak, you better be putting it up against Scripture. Your life is at stake. You will be the one that will have to answer for your decisions. Right? And he goes on. Rebellion is as a sin as witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Stubbornness, being thick-headed, despite being rebuked, plainly saying, this is the voice of the Lord, you're not listening. Still won't go through. It says iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And this is the expectation. You want to go against the word of God? You want to go against what he commanded? He is going to reject you in the age to come. Yeshua will reject you. Make no mistake. And you might say, well, he just, it says here he rejected him as king. That's not as bad as Nadab and Abihu got it. Well, if we go on to 1 Chronicles 10, we read, So Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord, because he did not keep the word of the Lord, and also because he consulted medium for guidance. One thing I can tell you is this. Lawlessness leads to more lawlessness. That's the expectation. When you start taking it upon yourself that you've devised a better way to worship the Lord than what He has commanded in Scripture, lawlessness will lead to more lawlessness. And pretty soon grace becomes lawlessness. It's a perverted form. You start twisting and contorting it. Just because you feel... You should honor God in, in, in a particular manner. It doesn't mean you're honoring God. It doesn't mean that your gesture, your sacrifice, is acceptable before God. It doesn't mean it. In Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. And we go on to Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And I always say, well, isn't that great? Because every one of us have a heart. And now what I just read is it's deceitful above all things. There is nothing more deceitful than your heart and your mind. Ponder that. The most deceptive thing in the world is your own heart and your mind. You are not safe to listen to. Trust me. The dictates of your own mind and the thoughts of your heart, how you want to rationalize and justify, it is not safe. You've got to filter it through the Word of God. And we continue, Proverbs 28, 26, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. You cannot trust in your own heart. When it comes to serving Yeshua, when it comes to honoring Him, you have to walk very very carefully. Ephesians 5.15, see that you walk circumspectly, which is to say carefully. All right? See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. What does Yeshua say in Matthew Matthew chapter 7? Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. But narrow the gate, difficult is the way that leads to life. And then there's something that he adds, the last seven, I think it's seven words of that sentence. And there are few who find it. There are very few who find it. Let me continue to to build upon this story of Nadav and Avihu and what really happened that day. I want to do it by sharing another story with you. See, this is the reality. All these stories we read about, they're not just stories. In Romans 15, they're left for our doctrine to teach us. The things that were written before were written for our didascalia, for our doctrine. We're to glean from these things. They're powerful. They cut to the heart. 
Let me take you to a story found in 1 Kings. Similar in nature as to the first two stories we've covered. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 25. And then Jeroboam. And for those of you who don't know Jeroboam, when the kingdom of Israel was split into two kingdoms, Judah, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, took kingship of Judah. Jeroboam, which the Lord gave Jeroboam, the kingship of Israel, the northern tribes, okay? The northern territory. That's who this Jeroboam is. He's king. King of Israel. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. Also he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, pay attention. He said in his heart, oh, oh, right? Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of the, this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Yehuda, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So he actually received the kingdom of Israel from God. It was supernatural. You can go back and read the event. It was given to Jeroboam. He was ordained to be king of, of Israel. Immediately upon being king of Israel, he starts doing something, listening to his own heart, devising, thinking of his own accord, not wanting people to go up to Jerusalem. which, oh, isn't that interesting? That's exactly where Torah says they have to go to worship the Lord. Torah commands, this is a commandment, you go to Jerusalem. But he is saying, mm, I don't like that. I don't like this whole concept. So what's he do? He begins to think. Therefore the king asked advice. He made two calves of gold and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Amazing. It's too hard. You can't do it. That is too much work for you. I have a better way. This is what he's saying. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Sound familiar? It's exactly the scenario that happened when Moses went up to the mountain. And the people started thinking for themselves. And Aaron went right along with it. And we see the exact same thing happening here. It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel, which has been the southern point of his kingdom. All right? And the other he set up in Dan. That was all the way to the farthest north part of his kingdom. Quite brilliant, really, on where he set up these, these calves. Now we continue. Now this is the thing that became a sin for the people. Went to worship before the one as far as Dan. And he made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who are not the sons of Levi. This is the breakdown. Total collapse. He is now making and ordaining people that Torah forbids to be Kohanim, to be priests. He's now ordaining a commoner. According to his own dictates. Are you guys starting to see a pattern here? You see a pattern in the life of Saul? That, okay, I am going to honor God in the way that I see fit. And I know you commanded me to go destroy things, but I have a better way. I'm just going to save the best and I'm going to honor you. Think about what the church has done to the Sabbath, to Shabbat. They have a better way, apparently. It goes against the plain word of the text. It goes against the commandment of the Lord, but they have a better way. And that is we'll worship on on Sunday because we're going to pay homage to Yeshua. And we're paying homage to Him. They're moving in the spirit of Saul. They are moving in the spirit of Jeroboam. The church is suffering from the spirit of Jeroboam today. On so many levels, they have a better way of doing things. Well now, the most recent is that, well marriage, it can be between a man and a man. That's okay. Progressive. It's progressive. That's, of course, our God's progressive. Therefore, man and man is okay, despite what Scripture says. 
The, def- the, the, the definition is man and woman. And you can't get around it. But you do when you listen to your own heart. When your heart starts devising your path, your halakha, your walk, you are dead. You are already dead. You are Nadab and Abihu. You are Saul. You are Jeroboam. We need to tremble in the fear of God. We have so many other things that I could address. I will spare you the time that the church is doing that is falling into the same suit of Jeroboam out of his own heart. We continue in the story, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 32. And Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month. Well, isn't this fabulous? Like the feast that was in Yehuda, and offered sacrifices on the altar. For those of you who did not catch this, he sanctified, he ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month. Now what's interesting is he's playing off of, he's imitating God's commandment. The 15th day of the 7th month is the Feast of Tabernacles. Ordained by God, written in His Word, and commanded for His people to observe. But here we go again. Jeroboam has a better way. He's going to imitate God. This is what Satan does, his M.O. I'll imitate it. It'll be just like it. It just won't be on the same day. Sound familiar? Again, going back to Shabbat. So he did at Bethel. Now that was brilliant. Holding this, holding this, ordaining this feast and having it at Bethel to prevent anyone, because this is the southern point of his kingdom, to prevent anyone going to actually Yerushalayim. You'd, have, you'd go through Bethel. It would, you would go there instead. It's too far. Do you go to Jerusalem? You, just, you can stop right here. And at Bethel he installed the priests, which, by the way, were not priests, according to the command of the Lord, of the high places which he made. Uh, verse 33. So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month and the months which he had devised in his own heart came from his own heart and he ordained a feast for the children of Israel. It wasn't for the pagans. It was for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burnt incense. Does this sound familiar? Where you have somebody changing feast days, imitating, can you say Easter? What happened to Passover? The day the Lord commanded. Pesach, right? On the 15th day of the first month. No, we have a better way. We have a much better way. We hide Easter eggs and have the Easter bunny run around. In our service, total introduction of pagan practices on a different day. Spirit of Jeroboam. It's the spirit of error. It's the spirit of paganism. And Christmas, you look at the same thing. Oh, it feels good, and this is all about the birth of Christ. No, it's not. It's devising something out of your own heart and slapping the name of Jesus on it. It's polluted. It's full of paganism. We see all these errors. When you read these stories and you look what's going on, you're aghast. You want to run the other way. You want to run for your life, knowing how holy our God is. So stories like King Saul, stories like uh, Nadab and Abihu, like Jeroboam, understand it's all strange fire to the Lord. It's profane. We as bondservants of the Messiah Yeshua, we are to tread with reverence. Every word we speak, we've got to be careful because it will be taken into account. We do have an accountant and he is keeping tabs on us. He's watching what we say, he's watching what we do. Stories like these, when I read these stories and you read them back to back, It makes you want to run to the Word of God and clothe yourself with His truth. Clothe yourself with righteousness and never allowing your heart to dictate your path. Allow the Word of God to dictate it. And keep in mind, what did Paul say? We're the temple of God. The Ruach HaKodesh is supposed to be dwelling in us, 
But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, you defile this temple, he will destroy you. Nadab and Abihu. They defiled the temple, they were destroyed. Saul was destroyed. Jeroboam, his entire lineage was destroyed. Horrific, suffered a horrific curse of God. We are the temple of God and we need to provide a place of habitation for the Holy Spirit. We have to be pure. We have to be holy. I want to take you back to the story now in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1. Then Nadab and Avihu, the sons of Aaron, each took a censer, they put fire in it, and put incense on it, and offered profane, strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Moving on. And Moshe said to Aharon, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. That's it. When we approach, he must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. You think about Psalm 89. He is to be revered in the assembly of the saints. Our God is holy. Do not forget it. He will be the death of you. All these stories that I read, they forgot. They served a holy God. Now, in regard to the Lord actually being holy, and our observance of Him as holy, what do we have to do? I mean, I can say, regard the Lord as holy. What does that mean? What do you have to do to regard the Lord as holy? I'll tell you what you have to do. You have to identify with that which He says is holy. Every aspect. When he said food is unclean, in Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, it is unclean. Make the distinction. When he says Shabbat is holy, the festivals are holy, make the distinction. See, this is where the collapse of the priesthood happened in Ezekiel 22. They were supposed to be the teachers of Torah. And yet they did not teach the people to distinguish between holy and unholy, clean and unclean. Total collapse, and they were destroyed. They were totally destroyed because of it. If we're going to regard Yeshua as holy, we need to keep His commandments. His commandments are righteousness. All your commandments are righteousness. Psalm 119, 172, right? All His commandments are holy. The law, the Torah is holy. And people try telling me the Torah is done away with it. It's the most insane thing I've ever heard in my life. It is holy. It's holiness. Look at what Leviticus 20 says in regard to holiness. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy for I am the Lord your God. He's commanded us to be holy. What does that look like? He continues and tells us and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. That's what it means to be holy. So if you think Yeshua is holy, if you really believe in your mind that Yeshua is holy, we'll know it by your fruit, by your decisions. The world will not be making your decisions. Your employer will not be making your decisions. Your own family members will not be making your decisions. You will in the fear of God, and you will be going against the grain, and you will suffer persecution. As we continue in Leviticus 20, we read the following, or um, uh, <laughs> taking from Leviticus 20, going to the New Testament, we see Peter says the same thing. He says the following in 1 Peter 1.13, Gird up the loins of your mind. Watch out. This is what I'm saying. Do not trust your mind. Don't let the things of the world into your mind. Stop thinking. Let Yeshua do the thinking for you. Be sober. Rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. One thing I want you to note here, it says, I'm going to read it again. Rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation. In other words, all this time and in this age, is pain and suffering. Difficult will be the way. Tribulation is what we are promised. 
And then the grace, the total salvation, the total rest will be revealed at his coming. This is how it's going to go down. As obedient children, not as disobedient, obedient. Not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Here's Peter. Apparently Peter was not informed that Torah is done away with. Because he's quoting the Torah. Be holy as I am holy. Yeshua quotes it. He quotes it in a different manner, a beautiful manner. He says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. This is what Yeshua says. All of it is telling us to fear God. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Fear God and keep His commandments. So when you come in in relationship with Yeshua, you commit your life to Him, you better walk in holiness because He is holy. And I'll end with this verse. It's so powerful. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The writer of Hebrews knows what he's talking about. We're going to end here. Music team can come back. It's the day.